Red's virtual cinematography series, Behind the Look, That Shot. I'm Nada Albright. I work with filmmakers for Red. Today we're going to speak with underwater cinematographer Roger Horrocks, who specializes in wildlife sequences for documentaries and features. In just the last few years, Roger has been nominated and won several awards for his work. We're going to focus on a couple of his recent projects for the award-winning Netflix documentary, Our Planet, and the hugely popular and also award-winning documentary, My Octopus Teacher. Hello, Roger. Welcome. Thanks, Nada. It's great to be here. So you're in Cape Town right now, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm based in Cape Town. Did you grow up by the ocean? I did. Um, I grew up actually on the east coast of South Africa in the Indian Ocean. Um, used to collect mussels with my dad. My dad was a spear fisherman. So it's very much been a kind of integral part of my life right from the beginning. Now, how did you mix your love with the water and college and your studies? Because I know you've been, you, you have a couple of degrees. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when I was certainly at school and, and growing up, you know, the options were like five options. It was like lawyer, doctor, accountant, or engineer. I mean, it was really the kind of the gamut of it. And um, my plan was to become a was to become an advocate, um, and I studied that at, at university. But I had a deep passion for the ocean, um, and it was actually during my university years that I I, I got into spearfishing um, in a in a very kind of serious way. I competed competitively. Um, and funny enough, I decided to do a, a master's degree in philosophy. And my plan was when the weather was bad, I was going to study. And when the weather was good, I was going to spearfish. And of course, I never ended up getting the degree because the weather in Natal is pretty good. So, yeah, but that was it was kind of it was it was just those were two very key passions of mine, you know, ideas and 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 the ocean. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just been it's just been wonderful to have this opportunity to bring all those passions together in this role as an underwater cinematographer. Now, in your early days, you worked with Jacques Cousteau's cameraman, Didier uh, Noirot, is that correct? That's right. He really got you started in the field. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? And that's the, the astounding thing about, about what we do is that, it, you know, the craft, it's, it's very much an apprenticeship model. Um, so I was really fortunate. It was actually a, a producer who I still work with a lot today, Hugh Pearson, who employed me as a, a camera assistant. And on that shoot, I met Justin McGuire and Didier Noro, who, as you mentioned, was Jacques Cousteau's cameraman. And, you know, he really set the bar for me just in terms of, um, you know, I mean, just, just unbelievable ability to move and to get these very dynamic shots. So... Yeah, he, he was massively influential on, on me and, and obviously on the style that I've developed. Now, you probably didn't shoot red that far back. When did you pick up a red camera and, and why did you end up staying with it? I know that almost everything you're shooting right now is through the red lens. Well, it's, it's, it's really been interesting because back in the day with Didier, it was the Sony F900 and the, the uh, Panasonic Vericams that were kind of dominant in the wildlife industry sector. That was kind of in the you know, 2005, six, seven, around there. And then, you know, when, when Red came on the scene with this kind of revolutionary approach, um, it's, you know, there was obviously skepticism as there always is to new technology, but very quickly the wildlife cameraman, you know, got into the tech um, and it, some of the critical things were obviously the pre-record functionality, which for us was, was absolutely critical. And I've just seen a, a, a kind of a steady very steady adoption over those periods to the point now where it is absolutely the kind of default, um, you know, camera system to go with. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sort of certainly hoping to, I'll shortly have my third body, which will, which I'm very excited about. Fantastic. Well, today we're going to take a look at a few clips, one sequence from my octopus teacher, and then a few from our planet. We're going to run them with sound first, and then we're going to um, chat with Roger a little bit, and then we're going to run it without sound, and we get the opportunity to hear uh, some kind of behind the scenes and Roger's feelings about and his experience and challenges per scene. Um, so we're going to start with My Octopus Teacher. Uh, let me ask you this. How long have you known the host and the producer, Craig Foster? 
Yeah, we, we've been friends for a long time. I, I first met Craig in about 2005 when I just left corporate and was trying to get into the film industry. Um, and we, we struck up a friendship and, and ended up actually making three films together. Um, and in fact, it was through the process of making those films that Craig got burnt out. So, yeah, we've, we've shared, you know, many experiences in the field together, um, you know, many highs and lows. And, and he's, he's become an incredible friend to me. Um, and yeah, it's just, just a, a great privilege to have him in my life. It's like two philosophers, two cinematographers. It's a, a rare combination, I think. So let's take a look at uh, the opening sequence of My Octopus Teacher. Cool. A lot of people say an octopus is like an alien. But the strange thing is, as you get closer to them, you realize that we're very similar in a lot of ways. You're stepping into this completely different world. Such an incredible feeling. And you feel you're on the brink of something extraordinary. But you realize that there's a line that can't be crossed. started she's such a star you know Craig says you realize that there's a line that can't be crossed what does that mean to you and does that extend into you know translate into filming as well I think the line between order and chaos is an incredibly fine one um, and <clears throat> obviously as, as documentarians we kind of you know, really programmed not to interfere with the things that we're seeing. It, it does become very difficult when you, like Craig, especially, you know, spending so much time with that animal and then seeing that animal in jeopardy. It's, it's incredibly difficult not to try and intervene and alter the, the course of those events. Um, but yeah, I, I, increasingly in my life, I'm realizing that the, the line between, you know, order and chaos is, is incredibly thin. The coast is so violent and dangerous. Um, I was wondering, is it difficult to prep and just to shoot in general in those kind of, uh, that kind of environment? It is, it is tricky. And I mean, we, we, because of the violent nature and the tempestuous nature of, of the coast, we obviously had to spread the filming out over a, a very long period of time. And I think, you know, we could never have made this film or got this material if we didn't both live in Cape Town. So that was absolutely key to, you know, being able to develop the archive and really focusing on those, on those really good days. Um, and also it was quite shallow. So another key cinematography challenge was that it was a very surgy, you know, very difficult to keep your camera steady. So, so yeah, we, we, and it, and it was, it was really a, a huge learning curve, you know, basically Initially, I shot way too much on the wide um, because it's just easier to do that. I know any cinematographer, you, you kind of, you know, you see, you look in your viewfinder and it just looks good. But as I got more and more into it and started to really understand both the animal and the environment, you know, I started to introduce much tighter lenses. Um, I used the 70 to 180 Nikkor, which is, a, which is basically an incredible macro zoom lens. And a lot of those shots that you see in that sequence were, and I'll talk about that now, were, were shot with that. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult coast, but, but 
if you have the patience and the time, it's, you know, that you see it in the film, the dynamic nature is so worth the effort. It is. Like Craig, do you relate in this need to get back into the water when you've, when you've been gone for a while? You know, obviously when I've been gone for a while, I'm generally in the water. So I kind of sometimes have the opposite where when I come home, I'm actually really happy to just like sit in the house for like three, four days and not even see the ocean or get in the sun. Um, but I, I totally understand what he's saying. And I have the same thing. I mean, that whole concept of nature deprivation, you know, when you and I experienced it now with COVID, with lockdown. I mean, I was at home for eight months, which is like the longest I've ever been home. And it was fantastic for my family. But you do, you, you know, you start to feel that kind of essence just leaching out of you. Well, let's, um, let's talk about a little bit more about your nature, uh, your relationship with nature as a wildlife cinematographer. Um, Craig talks about watching trackers and how they see subtle signs in nature, uh, making him long to be inside the natural world. Can you expand on what that means to you and what it means to be uh, so close to nature all the time for your job? Well, I think it's, it's, it's so critical. You know, in spearfishing, we speak about something called fish sense, which is this ability to know, you know, when certain fish are around and where they're going to be. And it, it really is very much akin to a tracking kind of skill. And I think what it is, I've thought about this quite a bit, is through experience and through, through immersion in that environment, your body actually remembers, even though you can't recall it consciously, but your body will remember the temperature, the, the water color, the reef structure. And there's a deep memory of something that happened in the past that then makes you more alert. Because you know that whole thing, you see what you look for. You know, I mean, it's, it's so fundamental cinematography. I mean, the intentionality thesis, you see what you look for. So, you know, I think that all that time spent for me as a, as a spear fisherman um, has definitely given me this ability to, to be intuitive and to have a better sense of what's going on around me. And um, it's, it's definitely experience which I draw on every single time I'm in the water with a camera. I would imagine um, as you became more experienced, this sense of, you know, you're waiting and waiting and waiting for hours. And it's not just like this spur of the moment. It's this, you, you kind of know when that, that moment that you've been waiting for comes, right? You have a sense of how to anticipate for that. You definitely do. And I mean, with, with wildlife filming, you know, the, the, moments, the moments can be anything from 30 seconds to, to three hours. I mean, it all depends. And, you, and that's the beauty. And that's what I love about it is that you never, ever know how you're actually going to break that scene down. And that, that sense of pressure is, 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 is astounding. But, yeah, I, I really enjoy it. This is a silly question, but does it help you with humans? You know, can you anticipate human behavior as well now? Have you become a little bit more patient with your own kind? Well, you know, it's, it's funny because one of the things that I, I really have kind of has become very clear to me is that, you know, the, the gradient between animals and humans. I mean, basically, we're just on a gradient, right? I mean, we are fundamentally animals. Um, and I think, I think that's one of the great travesties of science is that it has driven this, this thinking that animals are just something completely different. They don't have emotions. They don't think. Um, and, and if there's one thing that I've, I've really taken out of 15 years it's the fact that animals are absolutely like us you know you have individuals they've got different characters they have emotions Um, and that really is something that increasingly I'm trying to bring through in my in my in my visual work it's wonderful and I think it uh, really shows my octopus teacher especially we're going to run the clip again this time without sound and so we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts Obviously, the massive advantage we had was just how spectacular and beautiful and almost kind of, I mean, alien in a way, but just the palettes and the colors and the moods. And as, as I mentioned earlier, that sort of dynamic energy that we had to work with obviously made things a lot easier. That was a shot, actually, that I was really proud of was the, the octopus coming through. That was really tight and shot, shot really wide open as well. But one thing you'll notice here as well is that there was... You know, there were a lot of different kind of environments. We used a lot of different cameras. Craig obviously was using a very small camera. 
And that was fundamental to the style was, you know, how do we actually shoot it in a way that blends the different cameras and the different styles and doesn't make it sort of, you know, one looking incredibly stable. So we elected not to use any, any tripod for my octopus teacher and to keep things more reportage And I think it worked incredibly well. It's very hard to, you know, pick up a difference. And I think that's when cinematography is doing its job. When you, when you, you know, it's not about the cinematography, but you become completely immersed in the actual story. And, and, and that was something that we were very consciously trying to do um, in this film. Let's talk about our planet now. I'd love it if you could introduce some of those clips for us. Um, now, the first clip is the coastal seas. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Well, this was the, the producer on this, uh, Hugh Pearson, who I've been working with for, for about 15 years. Um, this was quite an unusual. Uh, the ambition of the shoot was quite unusual because we weren't really going for a whole sequence with kind of, you know, dynamic behavior, you know, almost like a mini Pixar type scenario. We really were looking for um, material that we could introduce the coastal seas and then close off with a strong environmental message. And that's why he chose Mosul um, in Raja Ampat, because the location we were based in was actually an old fishing camp that had been turned around um, and was now like an eco lodge. Um, and it, it, it was one of those shoots where we, we went in with a set of expectations, things like, oh, we're not going to have a problem with visibility, we're in Raja Ampat. Um, and it turned out to be way more difficult than we imagined. Well, why don't we take uh, a look at this uh, clip? Immense shoals of fish throng our shallow seas. These are anchovies. Small fish, in turn, sustain bigger ones. Hunters, such as giant trevally. And mobula rays. When hunters such as these work together, they become extremely efficient. seas are the fishing grounds of our planet and can provide an abundance of food for wildlife and humanity. The seas fringing land make up less than a tenth of the world's oceans. Yet, astonishingly, 90% of all marine creatures live in these coastal waters. This superabundance is due to the fact that the seafloor here is within reach of sunlight. It is truly an alien planet. You know, there's one scene that looks like it's above ground. That The shoal looks like clouds. Um, before we watch this with, without sound, just is it like an alien planet when you're down there? Or you just is it completely just different? You have to get in a different mindset once you start? I think it is. I mean, it's 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 alien in the sense that, you know, you haven't if you haven't experienced, it's obviously alien. for me, it's 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 incredibly familiar. But, you know, the, the three dimensionality of the space, and, and certainly this is something I'll talk about want to talk about in terms of you know, the camera work, because effectively you're, 
you know, you are a drone. You are, you, you know, you, you're basically operating in those, in those kind of, four, you know, three dimensions. So it's, 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 it's very hard to describe that feeling of being in there and then moving and then moving around. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't, for me, it's definitely not alien. It's, it's, it's deeply, deeply familiar. Yeah, you're lucky. Well, let's watch it again uh, with your thoughts. Shoots are normally around three weeks, so we're normally looking at about you have about I would imagine you know at least fifteen to twenty days on location, and on this particular one, we had bad visibility. We actually all of this material was literally shot on two days on this specific pinnacle, which is where these anchovy aggregates. And what was absolutely crucial here were two pieces of equipment. The first was uh, rebreathers, which allowed us to do dives of up to three hours at a time and then pre-record. So pre-record on the red was critical. So what I was doing was literally on the rebreather, framing up the whole time, pre-record running, and then waiting for one of those essentially murmurations, which is when those mobular rays would actually run through. We were very fortunate to actually get that. As I said, all of that literally came out of two, two days of diving on that particular location when the conditions were right. And again, you know, it was, it was kind of being underneath the ball it was very very dark so one had to kind of you know get the exposure right and work that out and then also having to get the coverage of them coming out the top i had the producer with me watching me and that is one of the most difficult things when you've got because you know remember as well he's looking he's seeing everything i'm just looking down a viewfinder and once you commit to something you've got to stay with it i was just glad we didn't have underwater comms because that would have been really really distracting but no very pleased with the material that we got you know, you were talking about looking through the lens. Talk about that uh, commitment with everything else going on around you. That's got to be, especially with a the producer there, you know, talk about that. I mean, I've never worked on, on a feature, but in a feature you've got, you know, everything is, I would imagine, is, you know, it's completely scripted. Um, there's a lot of preparation. Sure, there's things that happen and that kind of emerge, but you know, generally you've got control. In, in this context, um, the, the, the FOMO is like a massive factor. Like, I mean, it's it's it, it is so huge, and it 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 can it can really mess with your mind. And I think you know, with experience, you you start to develop a certain practice and a certain methodology as to how you pick apart, especially something that's dynamic like this, a bait ball. Um, and, and you do, you know, you have to commit. You've got to, once you, you see that image, you've got to let it resolve. You've got to kind of let it leave frame. And there is always that temptation to quickly move and cut to the next thing. It's interesting because often what I, what I see in the, in, in the material and what I actually have in my mind, you know, it's, it, they often are two different things because you do absorb so much more. Um, and you do miss. I mean, clearly you miss. It's just the nature of the beast. But that's, that's the challenge. Well, the next... Um clip we're going to look at is about a bait ball. So what is a bait ball and uh, what are we going to uh, take a look at right now? Bait balls are, are kind of classic. Um, we call them, we call it chasing bait. So they're these very elusive events that happen uh, way out in the ocean um, and they're absolutely not guaranteed. I would probably say that bait ball shoots are like 50-50. So there's a good chance of going, spending three weeks at sea and getting absolutely nothing. Um, and this, this case in point was the Azores, um, and basically a bait ball is where you have predators, either dolphins or sharks that drive a chunk of, of, of bait fish up from, from the bottom and then ball them near the surface and then basically just pick away at them until, until there's nothing left. Um, and this sequence in particular was, this was, this was arguably, I would say without doubt, in fact, not arguably, without doubt, it was the, the toughest um, open water shoots I've, I've ever done. Wow. All right, let's take a look. Dolphins explore the vast open ocean in search of the riches that distant deserts may have nourished. A shoal of mackerel has discovered a swarm of krill. 
the small crustaceans that feed on the ocean's floating microscopic plants. But the mackerel themselves are food for the dolphins. the mackerel towards the surface and into the range of birds, shearwaters. The wings that normally propel the birds through the air now drive them six meters down through the water. Whilst the birds pick off the top of the shoal, Dolphins attack the underside. minutes of feasting, the predators from both the sea and the air have had their fill. Again, as I mentioned earlier, bait ball is always difficult. We ended up spending 25 days at sea. It was in summer, so we were doing 10 hours a day. So that's 250 hours at sea. And the core bait ball sequence that I shot lasted nine minutes. The whole event lasted nine minutes. So the krill was a separate event, but unfortunately we didn't use much of that. That was quite an amazing thing to see with the, with the krill and then these actual bait fish feeding on them. But the, the, the bulk of the sequence, which is the dolphins feeding on the anchovy with the birds, literally lasted um, yeah, nine minutes real time. So yeah, you know, coverage in, in that context, and that's really the point that I'm making is, is you know, that you just don't know how long it's gonna last. And also, when you come into the water, you are now influencing the action as well. And that's a critical thing about underwater cinematography is you can't sit in a Land Rover with a long lens. You know, you, you're fundamentally in the middle of the action. The animals are aware of you, they're conscious of you. And, and that's, again, this, this, I call it the dance, but, you know, between getting in and getting shots and obviously disrupting the behavior. And again, that's just something that you, 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 know, you develop over time. But one of the things I really enjoyed, what I really tried to do with this was just roll. Just roll the camera and then move and let things kind of unfold around me. Um, and it, it really worked out beautifully in, in this particular um, sequence and I know the the um, the producer was regretful afterwards of, of, of not actually having run the shots a bit longer but yeah uh, incredible thing and, and funny enough when those birds were coming down to me they thought that I was a piece of bait I was in a black wetsuit so they were like attacking me which which worked out beautifully from a filming perspective because you get these shots of them coming straight down to camera but yeah again as I say and especially because we were in summer you know we were launching at four in the morning uh, going out for five hours, coming back, sleeping for an hour, and then going back out again until nine o'clock at night. And, then, and we didn't have one down day. That was the other thing. We had no down days. The weather was really good. But, you know, the reward of, of getting it is, is, is so worth the effort. Love it. Let's talk about whales. This is like my favorite. Uh, it just brought me to just tears when it first uh, when I first watched it. Tell us about this uh, this clip and also your experience. This was one of those you know once in a lifetime opportunities. It actually happened on my back door. I mean, these whales we filmed these whales off Cape Town, um, and it was a phenomenon. You know, this, these aggregations had been happening. We weren't really aware of it. Um, uh, until a friend of mine took a photograph from his gyrocopter and we could see the immense scale of it. Um, and that really set up the opportunity to go and film them. 
And again, the other thing that had to happen was the visibility. And we were just very fortunately blessed with two days of really good visibility. And I cannot, you know, the first, it's the first time I've dived with humpback whales, um, they're all male. They're like juvenile males, um, very inquisitive. And it's like, the only way I can describe it is it's almost like being surrounded by a herd of brontosaurus, like back in the Jurassic times. And they're just eating on plants around you and, you know, completely conscious of your presence, moving their fins around you to not harm you. Um, there were one or two that, that got a little bit, you know, aggressive with, with tail swipes and things like that. But that's just their way of saying back off. But I remember that first encounter, the two, three hours, I, I couldn't speak when I came home. I couldn't process what I'd seen. I actually couldn't, couldn't process it. Um, but we were very fortunate to get the footage. And then again, with Hugh Pearson, we mobilized you know, an aerial team and were able to, to get um, you know, the topside aerial shots. Beautiful. It's still something that I find difficult to make sense of in a way. Um, and to, to verbalize that, that experience. I believe you. Well, let's take a look. Humpback whales. They live in every ocean, traveling the high seas from their polar feeding grounds to the tropics where they breed. Yet whales have not always enjoyed such freedom. Once there were more than a hundred thousand humpbacks in the oceans, but last century they were hunted to near extinction. Just a few thousand survived the onslaught. A huge public outcry finally led to a ban on commercial whaling in 1986. Since then, the number of humpback whales has been steadily increasing. They're returning to their ancestral feeding grounds, like these off the coast of South Africa. They're gathering to take advantage of a seasonal abundance of krill, tiny shrimp-like crustaceans. The whales take in great mouthfuls of water trapping the krill on sieves of hairy bristles that line their jaws. Each whale can eat over a ton a day. so plentiful, fur seals come to claim their share. scenes were unimaginable just a few years ago.
They form supergroups, hundreds strong. the greatest gathering of whales seen for a century. Whales recycle nutrients that enrich surface waters which fuel the growth of phytoplankton. And they, in turn, feed krill in a perfect self-sustaining cycle. We now know that a healthy community of great hunters, whales, dolphins, tuna, and sharks, is essential for a fully functioning ocean. And a functioning ocean is vital to the health of our planet and humanity. In a remarkable recovery, humpback whales have almost returned to their original numbers. But during that time, we have done more harm to the oceans than ever before in human history. With global cooperation, will our oceans recover and thrive once again. We saved the whales by international agreement. Now it is time to save our oceans. First of all, Attenborough is a treasure. <laughs> um, secondly, this is such a great example of how you can make an impact as a filmmaker, a global impact. Um, before you, before we roll it again, tell me a little bit about your experience um, on that side of it, how you feel about your position with them. Are you talking about from a conservation perspective? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I've, I've always been very conscious of the, of the environmental challenge and I, I always kind of felt that I was doing enough by just being a wildlife cinematographer. Um, but I'm increasingly realizing that it's, it's not enough. Um, you know, we're at such a critical stage of, of this whole kind of evolution of, of you know, being human and civilization and the, and the threat to biodiversity. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I almost feel a, a debt to those animals. I mean, they have given me so much, um, the animals that I work with and, and film with. And I really, I'm not quite sure exactly how yet, but I'm, I'm definitely starting to get more involved in just trying to amplify that message about, you know, what needs to be done and help people kind of understand the predicament because, yeah, we, we're just not, not opening our eyes up to what's coming. Um, and that is obviously very concerning. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at it again. And this time, I'd love to hear your experience. That was actually me handheld with the dragon, um, which is pretty cool. Obviously shooting over cranks. But, you know, we we just trying to get moments and bits and pieces. The, the top side work was all done um, on Cineflex with a helicopter. And then... Yeah, the, the, the bulk of the underwater footage really came from two days of diving where the conditions were good and, and were optimal. And I was really trying to work, you know, whenever you get into a new situation, you try and resolve it. You try and work out what frame rates to work. I regret in these two days not actually going a lot tighter. Um, that's one of the limitations. I had a 12 to 24, um, 10 to 24. So... With hindsight, the 24 mil really resolved. You know, you get more characterization. Um, you, you could just kind of identify with the animal more. 
but because the scene is just so incredibly dynamic and these, you know, you really want to try and capture that sense of scale. See that, that, that shot there would be a 24 mil. Um, and that obviously is, is on the 10 mil on the wide side. It was more difficult than one imagines. You know, the visibility was good, but it was still quite deep and trying to work out the behavior. And also the, the whales were feeding at a certain depth. So the krill density would, would fluctuate. And it was just trying to work out all those factors and then get yourself into the right position. I really was, there's the term in, in, in the zone of proximal development where, where you're like on the edge of failing. And it's kind of where you learn the most. And, and certainly in this context, um, you know, I was, I was stretched as a cinematographer and, and also just the whole experience was, was incredibly emotional and moving. Um, so, yeah, I'm just really pleased that, and also Hugh Pearson, the producer, I think did a phenomenal job to, you know, really tell that story of the way that these animals have come back through, through you know, proper focused attention to to get them conserved and it just shows you what what can what we can achieve if if as humans we we put the will in into allowing these animals to come back i love the sound of them too it's mesmerizing no that was actually one of the greatest revelations was funny enough when they were feeding they weren't making a noise underwater but on the boat it sounded like the deep rumblings of elephant and clearly there is a, you know, there, there must, there's kind of like an evolutionary sort of link to a degree. But um, yeah, I was just really delighted because this footage has not been seen before. This behavior generally happens down in Antarctica when it's very krill rich and the water tends to be quite dirty. So to have access to this aggregation and then to sort of reveal the workings of it for the first time. And of course the seals were wonderful in terms of, of giving scale um, to, to the size of these animals. So yeah, it, it, it definitely goes down as one of my most, um, sort of exhilarating and, and transformative experiences with, with wildlife that I've ever had. So grateful to have these, uh, images and did they, did they all show up at the same time or was it gradual? No, they definitely, the, the whales all hang out in groups and you'll see two modalities. What you're seeing now is the feeding behavior. But then there was also very much a socialization behavior. And that's when you see them towards the end where they're doing those like pirouettes around me and I had an yeah. assistant in the water. They were, they were checking us out. I mean, probably never seen humans underwater before. Very inquisitive and moving around. And at one stage, Aiden and myself, my assistant, we were actually corralled. I honestly felt like they were corralling us. And to have the intentionality of those big animals, highly intelligent, focused on you, was was actually over well, I actually got out I, I, I said to Aiden like th there were so many whales so close to us and they were clearly focused on us um, clearly didn't mean us any harm but but you know it, it was overwhelming I had to stop filming so and that says a lot I've only ever done that twice in my career yeah I mean, come on you're only human <laughs> it's like the most I got goosebumps when you told me about being corralled uh, that's uh, do you ever dream of that? I would imagine that might stay with you forever. It's, it's funny you say that because I've done, um, I've, I think over the last, since 2015, I've done about 260 days in the field with bottlenose dolphin. Um, and I, I, I do, I sometimes think of them. I know in Mozambique where I worked with them the most, I mean, I know, I know the animals, I know the individuals, um, I can imagine I'll wake up sometimes and think, okay, they're probably here having a social time here, you know, because they all have these different kind of modalities. And it's, it's, it is a great gift of, of this craft, it, are, are, those, are those memories. I bet. Well, um, you know, I'm just thinking of the bigger picture as we're, as we're looking at this. You know, Craig says, my octopus teacher, sometimes you feel, you just get a feeling about a creature and I love it when he says that there's something to learn there. I mean, I know you've been speaking of that, but is that something that you've experienced as well? You have this moment, even if it's not this giant whale, but something just like a mollusk or a, the smallest of sea creatures sometimes, you know, do you have that moment, especially with the octopus, I would imagine? I think that th those kind of moments come with what Craig was experiencing, obviously come with familiarity and with, with time with one animal. Um, you know, as a cameraman, you, you, you tend to be slightly more removed because, you know, 
your whole intention and whole modus operandi is to document. So often what will happen is when you're filming, you don't even really, you know, you're so focused on, on resolving the chaos and the movement that you don't actually really often see what's going on. You only kind of see it afterwards in the yeah. rushes. So there is that degree of kind of where the camera creates a kind of a barrier between you just by the necessity of having to do your job. But I think, I think my, the, the biggest thing for me, and I mentioned it earlier, has been this realization when I spend a lot of time with these, indiv- is, these animals, how different they are and the degree to which they have different likes, different personalities. You know, some dolphins will be very friendly. Others will be consistently assertive and aggressive. And, and, that, and, and even with crocodiles, you know, I've dived with Nile crocodiles in the Okavango Delta with Didier. It was actually with Didier that we, he introduced me to that. And again, you see the sentinels, you know, and, and I'm just increasingly so blown away by, you know, and how emotional I can get and reaction, reactionary I can get. You know, we are all of the same ilk, um, all on the same spectrum. So, yeah, that's, that really for me has been um, a very profound takeout from my time spent with marine animals. Obviously, mammals more so because they're more like us. But, you know, even, yeah. even, even like an octopus, which is, which is, you know, as far removed from us as possible, you can, you can have that, you know, you can see the resonance in the mirror. Um, it's quite astounding. I think in my octopus teacher, one of the things that is so lovely about the narrative is, is in the end he says, you know, you don't miss a day. He, does, he makes his choice not to miss a day. And I also see kind of analogy to life, but also um, looking th- through these things through a lens, through, through, even through an eyepiece is so different than looking at a monitor or looking with our bare eyes. And it's an analogy to life to me. Do you, you know, has your experience capturing wildlife changed the way you look at life? You know, it's, it's obviously on, on one level, it's a job and it's a career and it's something that I, I love and that, you know, it provides for my family. But yeah, spending time like we do um, and having that opportunity to reflect um, and just being able to to really focus, and I think that's been the critical thing. What's what's really helped me has been that maniacal focus on just becoming an underwater cinematographer and and put it just underwater as well. Not even being you know shooting topside, because as you say, you know, using that lens analogy, when you kind of really dial in and you really focus and you put in the time, I think that's when you create the potential for those kind of profound, more profound moments of growth um, and, 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 and also just in terms of actually developing your craft. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but... It does. Well, you, you're trusting yourself. Yeah, I think so. I think that that has been, um, has been an absolutely critical thing. And, and, you know, it's just that conviction and that absolute focus... Um, to the practice and then as those things emerge just learning from them reflecting and then feeding that back into the whole um, development cycle because that's really what it is isn't it it's about you know emerging and and becoming rather than being this thing and that's what you are I mean I think that's the great joy of 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 life um, is the fact especially as a human is that you can emerge you can evolve you know you're constantly evolving you're not just this one thing so um, yeah, I've just, just been very privileged to, to sort of be doing that in, the, in this context um, of the natural world. I think that your filmmaking allows us to be a part of these places and not just a visitor. And it begins a training for others to start seeing the world that way. And that, that's an incredible gift. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure. <clears throat> you know, and I think just to get back to my octopus teacher, I think in terms of genres, um, you know, what where where you know Pippa and, and the directors and Craig were so brilliant was that they they made a very simple film that was um, you know in essence a man sitting around a campfire telling a story of something that happened which is the archetypal context right um, and yeah. yet and yet they evoked so many layers you know the film is on one level it's a political film it's a feminist film. Um, it, it challenges our relationship with nature. It suggests a al- whole alternative relationship with nature, um, and and I'm certainly you know excited about about that 
the impact that it's had and about you know how we evolve the genres to 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 do a similar kind of thing and it's not easy i think that's a once in a lifetime film you know i don't think uh you know i mean i certainly don't think i'll be ever involved in anything like that sadly to say but it's a once in a lifetime film it was great great joy to be part of it well this has been a joy to to do with you and thank you so much for joining us um just Again, it's been lovely, and um, we have to say goodbye, but thank you so much for joining us, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again, and we'll continue to watch your work. No, it's been, it's been a pleasure, Nada. Thanks, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Bye. Ciao.